So first, you know, pharmacology is one of those things that doesn't stay static. Wouldn't it be great if we could just put our pharmacology book on the shelf and it could just sit there and we don't have to learn anything new? Unfortunately, or fortunately for our kids, everything changes very rapidly in this area. And as usual, 2014 was another one of those years. First, I have to say, uh, I have no relevant financial disclosures except for that I spent a lot of time writing. Our next edition of our textbook is in final uh, edits, which you can imagine my life. It's 53 chapters and um, comes out this summer. It'll be out in July. So today we're going to talk about pharmacology, or just this session, um, we're going to talk about sort of some of the developmental things, some of the new stuff that we're learning from um, sort of changes in, in the way that we fund pediatric research and the way we look at that. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about obesity, but truly we don't have a lot of information on that. And then different issues that um, impact prescribing. So what's new? So the Best Pharmaceutical Cheerleading Act, I'm going to give a little update on that. Um, some new uh, things around pharmacokinetics. We're going to talk about genetics, lactating women, drug shortages, and some of the uh, MedWatch safety alerts. So 2014 set a record for the number of new entities approved by the FDA. The average is around 25 a year for the last oh, 08 to 10 years, and there were 41 new drugs. Um, and um, it, it's exciting, it's very exciting we have all these new drugs coming on the market. When you're in the middle of writing a farm book, you're constantly changing things. We're like, can they just go on vacation? Because <laughs> we need to get this book out. But the exciting thing is that there are some new drugs. A new hepatitis C drug came out. There's some, a, a number of new uh, cancer uh, drugs that have come onto the market in the past year. Um, we have a new uh, thrombo, uh, throm uh, thrombolytic, which seems like there's been a new one every year. The new one is Zonivity. Uh, there's a number of new drugs for rare diseases, um, one for mucopolysaccharidosis type 4A, and um, some others, uh, one for tropical leishmaniasis and cattleman's disease. So we have some new drugs that are pretty exciting, not very many of them for um, pediatrics at this point, but some of these will probably have um, pediatric implications as they do more studies. The most important thing is that 17 of them were the new drugs that were the first in their class. So these are talking about brand new, never any, you know, a lot of drugs come on the market through sort of me-toos, okay, there's another proton pump inhibitor, there's another, you know, statin. But these are new drugs, and this is really exciting for um, long-term care for all of our patients that we've got lots of drug research happening. There are, this is sort of the diagram that came out um, from the, uh, FDA about all the new um, drugs, but just, just to know there's, there's a lot, and there's a couple that are new antibacterials, and, um, but otherwise a lot of them are more for uh, more rare diseases, which is um, pretty exciting. So to back up to pediatrics, just because one, one of the things that happens is, is every drug that comes on the market now has to be studied for its use in children, or at least looked at. So over the last 15 years, we've had sort of this amazing evolution of where drug information is related to children and prescribing. Uh, it, how many of you have been PNPs since the mid-90s? Okay, 1993 is when I became certified. Okay, I have 21 years for me. Um, when we got out of school and we were looking things up, it, basically most of the drugs said uh, not have, has not been studied for use in children, or safety and efficacy has not been determined for children under age 12. Remember that? And so, it's, and so, and statistically, 75% of drugs said that, but we still were prescribing them. We were still out there going, well, you know, it works in adults, so we'll work, do it in kids. And so the, what happened in the mid-90s is there was a real move to say, this is not okay. We really need to study drugs in children. So the, in 1997, there was the pediatric um, exclusive, there was the, the FDA MA um, Act and then the pediatric exclusivity provision. And what that um, really looked at is the first time where they said, okay, when drugs come on the market, we need to, like, study them in kids. Okay, we can't just um, do that. So there was a... Um, uh, a little pushback from the pharmaceutical industry, and that got overturned by the courts. And so a, a stronger uh, law went through Congress in, in 2012 called the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act. And what that act really said is that, um, you know, children 
uh, we need safe drugs for children, and we need to make sure that drugs are studied in children and that the FDA has the ability to send a letter to the company that's manufacturing these medications and say, you need to study these drugs in children. They gave a little bit of a, um, a carrot uh, that said, if you study them in children, we'll extend your patent for six months. So if you've got a big name, big dollar drug like um, uh, Prilosec, which was one of the first ones, in six months, you can make a lot of money, okay? And so, so that sort of gave the manufacturers a little bit of uh, initiative to do these. And then in 2003, the P Pediatric Research Equity Act um, passed. And what that was was a act that said any new drug, any new entity, any new formulation, any new indication had to be reviewed for use in children. So historically, what they did is they, they did adult studies, got it approved in adults, then the drug reps came around and said, well, you know, that, up at the university, they're using these in kids, right? And then we sort of, it trickled down without any real studies in children. And now what they're saying is, from the bottom up, it needs to be having research done in kids. And the only ones who can get away with not doing research in kids is that if it truly is a disease that doesn't happen in kids, like you don't have to study COPD drugs in kids, um, or um, if, it, um, if the animal studies indicated it would not be safe in children. So, so, so for about 12 years now, we've had this, and it's very exciting. Um, of course, like most laws, it sunsetted in 2007, and so we had to go through the whole congressional thing. Everybody was lobbying to get it passed. It, it made it through another five years. In 2012, it um, was passed, but it now has got a permanent, um, it won't ever sunset. So this is now permanently on the books, and it's now... Um, uh, a, uh, every, every drug that comes on the market now has got pediatric studies. So what does that mean? Well, I mean, in this time, since 1996, 546 drugs have been relabeled with specific actual information about children. That's huge. This is, this is a win. This is exactly what the goal was when they started this, that we would have information that we needed to be able to prescribe to children. <clears throat> Additionally, one of the provisions was that they could go to the companies that, is, that are um, manufacturing these drugs and say, <coughs> this drug is used in kids, so let's, let's do some studies in children. Or let's, um, another thing that happened is they're collaborating with the Europeans because they have a lot of pediatric studies also and looking at how their studies look in children and say, do they have sufficient evidence-based um, information for us to say it's okay and kids are not, instead of us doing a whole other randomized controlled trial in children if they've already got good, solid information out of Europe. So, and so the European and the U.S. Um, drug uh, agencies are collaborating very closely and um, uh, so that we are able to get information uh, without having to do additional studies. So the additional things that's happened is that it used to be that if the drug trials didn't um, work, that manufacturers could actually have that information hidden from the label. So there were studies that were done clearly that showed a drug did not work. For example, some of the antivirals, um, amantadine and some other ones, um, clearly did not work and were harmful to children, but that information was never on the label because they made a deal with the FDA and they didn't have to do that. And so, so what was on the label was only the positive things and who it was supposed to be prescribed for. But the person down in their clinic in some little rural area, they didn't know that there was significant adverse effects in children from amantadine because it never was public knowledge. It's certainly not going to be published by the manufacturer. So, but what happens now is all the trials have to be on there. So whether it works or not, if there's adverse effects in a certain population, it has to be on the trial. Uh, has, those trials have to be on the label. So now what you get is if you read a label, and now all the labels are dated, so you go on to there, you go, to, what I do is I just Google the drug because they usually have the drug name .com, you know, or you can pull up Rx list as another great one that's accurate labels. And it will tell you exactly what happened, why it's not recommending kids, or why it is. The other exciting thing that has come out of this is I was, um, I've been a member of the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act Committee since 
I think 2003, about 10 years, off and on. Sometimes, you know, when you're not funded at the federal level, you don't meet. So there were years that was no money, so we didn't meet, but pretty much um, for about 10 years or so. And um, one of the exciting things that happened is this network of people that were really interested in high quality studies in children around medications formed this group. It's called the Pediatric Trials Network. And the Pediatric Trials Network is um, uh, an amazing group of people. I mean, and what's really exciting is you kind of got these old farm guys um, that are kind of getting ready for retirement. And they're sort of mentoring. Part of this is a mentoring. There's some NIH funding for PharmDs to study specifically children. And they're mentoring these young people in uh, bringing them up on um, doing pediatric trials. And so the expansion of what is uh, happening in pediatric drug research is significant around the pediatric trials network. And they're collaborating across sites. So they're, they're all over the place in the United States. Um, there's a couple, one in Europe. But basically, it's an alliance of clinical research sites. And basically, they cooperate on the design and conduct of the pediatric clinical trials. So you know, if you have a, a child with a fairly rare disease, you may only have one or two at each site. And so what they can do is they can collaborate across multiple sites so they can get a large enough um, pool of data on these kids to get some good findings. And um, so this is a very exciting uh, thing. And, and they're, and just amazing. If you go onto their website, they get all these studies that are happening. This is where the obesity stuff is really coming out. So what have they done so far? And this, this is a fairly new group. Remember, it used to take like years for things to kind of come to the forefront. You know, they do the research study and then it get published and then you finally get down to the practice level, you know, 10 or 15 years later. Part of the goal is to get this stuff to the practice level very rapidly. And so um, one of the things that they're doing is working with the NIH and getting their publications done and just moving so that this knowledge is getting out there. What is happening, some of this hasn't been published yet, but, it, but it's on their website. They looked at lorazepam versus diazepam to look at status of lapticus. They're equally as effective. Um, they're studying lithium for bipolar disorder in children. Uh, baclopin is used for spasticity, but they're also studying it because we haven't, uh, there's not super large uh, clinical trials and they want to just um, take a look at that, what it looks like long term. Um, a lot of neonatal research. Okay, one of the things, you've got a big pool of kids because there's NITUs everywhere, right? And, you, and they're in the hospital and you can draw blood. That's the other thing with doing pediatric trials. You've got to usually draw blood on them. So it makes them tough to do. So one of the things they looked at is dosing of acyclovir. Do you dose it by weight? Do you dose it by age from when they're born? Do you dose it by their gestational age? You know, how do you dose it to get the accurate? So what they determine is that they dose it by the menstrual age, so you by the date of mom's last menstrual period, and then go forward, and then they dose by that. So that should be coming on to the label soon. Ampicillin, they say all of the sources that are published right now are not correct for the neonates, the, the preemies, and so they're recommending some new um, dosing regimens for them based on their, their style studies where they've gone in. Now, we've been using ampicillin in those babies for a long time. I mean, I worked level two nursery in the mid-90s. No, mid-80s, mid-80s, and because... Um, I, it, I was pregnant, so you always, you know how you, I was like, that child was born and that's where I worked. So anyway, <laughs> and <laughs> so anyway, we've been using this. Now we actually probably realize we didn't dose it correctly all this time. So there'll be new dosing recommendations coming out for ampicillin for neonates. Um, clindamycin, they're looking at that in uh, obese kids. Um, you know, do you have to change it or not? And um, this one, they want to dose by weight alone. So you're going to see some of these come onto the label fairly quickly. They're part of the nice thing about the Pediatric Trials Network is they're very tightly connected to the NIH, uh, Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act Committee, who actually has a really tight uh, collaboration with the FDA. So the NIH sort of does the funding, the FDA does the labeling, and um, for a long time they didn't always work together. But this group is an amazing collaborative group all working together for pediatric drug safety so that this information gets from the researcher into circulation onto the label as quick as they can. So it's an exciting time, and, and this group is just, is just doing tons of work and, um, and lots of stuff coming out. Um, the other thing they're doing is, um, so one of the things that's hard to do with kids is get drug studies. Okay, so parents, you know, their kid's sick, 
and they're not going to necessarily sign their child up for a study. You know, we're not going to be the control group, or, or we're not going to be the placebo group. And um, but we still need to get data on on these drugs in kids. So one of the things they're doing, which is very creative, and and this is talks about how they can pull data, is they're doing these pop studies, which is. Um, uh, they're looking at what's called per standard of care. So let's say you have a child and they're in the hospital and the standard of care does get X antibiotic. And we don't have enough data on that. So what they're doing is, if it's a standard of care, they're just drawing a little blood. They're getting, of course, they're getting the um, consent of the parents. But a little bit of extra blood is going out and being sent for these pooled studies. And so that you're collecting data on these drugs that we're already prescribing that we don't have good data on. Maybe it's pharmacokinetic data, maybe it's therapeutic level data, or whatever, so that we're going to get large samples, but it's little pieces at a time. And um, so that we can be more accurate in what we're doing. And um, so that right now there's 37 drugs they're doing this with at these, cl these places all over the country. And so um, uh, I would expect over the next few years we're going to get that information into publication so that we are more comfortable with um, what we're doing as standard of care. Because we don't always have it. And, you know, we don't have, it isn't, it isn't ethical to put someone in the placebo group sometimes, right? And so this way we are collecting little bits of data from kids that are already getting these medications to help us um, solidify our um, information about medications. Additionally, there's two, three major studies going on. Um, they're looking at methadone uh, use in three-month to 18-year-olds. They're using methadone for pain. Um, uh, propranazole, we're looking at that for uh, 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 obesity dosing in six to 17-year-olds. And then um, there's, uh, there's these tapes that are used for um, uh, estimating weight for like in codes. And so there's a couple of them they are uh, finalizing. I think they're pretty much done. I, I don't know if they're in publication yet. There's two of them, one called Baby Tape and one's Mercy Tape at Ch from Children's Mercy. But looking at you know how you put the tape down, you lay the kid down, this is their estimated weight. They're really trying to um, uh, get, make sure those are solid and evidence-based. So it's a very exciting time. And uh, so next year I'll be back, and there'll probably be another 40 new things happening because it really is a constantly uh, changing uh, landscape, but in, for the better for our kids. And having been in this game and, and around this for the last 15 years, um, I'm very excited as we go forward that we are really doing what's best for kids versus sort of taking adult data and moving it down into children. So what do we know about obesity? Don't, don't you want to know this one? This is like, okay, I've got the 120 pound six-year-old. What do I do with them, you know? <laughs> they're as big as I am, and they're a kid. And so how do I dose that? What do I do? Well, uh, you know, I wish I could say that we have the answer, but we don't. So that's why we're studying it, because we've got to figure this out, because we've got all these obese kids. Uh, <clears throat> So one of the things we know is generally absorption is not effective. So we look at pharmacokinetics. Absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Those are the four pieces of pharmacokinetics. So absorption is not affected by obesity. It doesn't really change at all. The volume of distribution is altered. Because think about it. You've got a volume of distribution. Think about the glass. A glass that's holding all the stuff. And so... When you look at volume of distribution, you look at the intervascular volume, which is actually kind of small, and then you look at sort of, you've got fat, and you've got lean tissue, and you've got all these things. So if you have drugs that are lipophilic, they're gonna like fat tissue, okay? If you have drugs that are aqueous, they're, they don't like fat tissue, all right? So, so one of the things is that we know just normally, without being overweight, that the ratio of lean to fat changes as kids go through childhood. You got these chubby babies, and then toddlers are kind of chubby, and then they kind of get lean. Well, normal kids that aren't overweight get leaner. And then as they go through adolescent, the puberty, Males get more lean, girls get a little bit more fat. Okay, that's that. We know that just normally, okay? There are some seats up here, like, of course, they're right in the front in the middle, but it's okay. There's a couple up here in the front row, too. Um, so that's just the normal. So now we take kids that are overweight, right, and we have more fat than it predicted. So even if we have studies in kids, 
we didn't track whether the kids were obese or not. So, so even our studies don't say, okay, this is the dosing we do for an obese kid. Um, so we know that in obese kids, the lipophilic medications may or may not have a higher volume of distribution. So isn't that great? We got, we got, we don't know. Um, and that, um, uh, but we can theoretically. And from adult studies, we know that if it's highly lipophilic, it's probably going to go and distribute into the fat and sit there for a while and then come back out. So they often have longer duration of action because of that. Um, we, they think that they may have altered plasma protein levels in some kids. Where that's one of the things they're looking at. Um, metabolism. Some of these kids are getting non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Have you guys seen that yet? I mean, it's pretty awful that we're doing lip, liver enzymes in 10-year-olds to check for fatty liver disease, okay? But think about it. Just like an adult that has liver disease, these kids are not going to be able to metabolize drugs normally. So you, so you not only have this kid that you're trying to dose based on weight or what, what do you figure that out? But then you have to go, do they have a healthy liver? So are they going to be able to metabolize a drug normally? So all the things, we're getting all this great data on kids, but then we have a group of kids that may or may not do exactly what the rest of the kids do. So um, we do have to f factor in that. And then we know that larger people have um, larger kidneys and they will uh, have more renal blood flow. So th they may have alterations and elimination. What do we know? So when you, the ones you can, it's hard to do studies on this in kids, right? So you can imagine the parents. So we're doing a drug study and we would like your child to be in the fat kid group, and we'd like your child, you could be in the skinny kid group, all right? You just are not gonna be able to do that, right? And you, and you are like, how do you, how do you consent for that? You say, okay, so well, you know, we're doing a drug study and we're looking at different types of kids. I mean, it's hard, right? So who do we study? We study people that are already sick in the hospital. We already draw blood on. So we do have some data on kids that are, um, uh, um, and, and the other thing, too, is that as we're doing some of these POP studies, you know, these, we're, they're looking at the body, they're factoring in their BMIs. So they're collecting that data, too. So as we do these sort of little bits of data, the, one of the pieces we're adding in is their BMI. So that as we get that data, we can see if it's different as we pool it. Um, but so the, we do have some information on kids that are with um, cancer. And um, because they, you know, we draw blood on those kids all the time. And uh, so we know that uh, doxorubicinol is, uh, clearance is decreased with kids with more body fat, okay? And um, we do know that uh, gentamicin may have altered peaks and troughs in, in um, obese kids. And the interesting thing is you get one study that says one thing and another study that says another. So this has to be sorted out and it is one of the ones they're looking at because we don't know whether it's a difference in the study setup or what, and so that's why I can't say it's higher or lower because it could be um, some study variation. Um, we know that vancomycin um, troughs a little higher. Um, we know that enoxaparin um, kids require higher doses than adults. So enoxaparin is dose per weight, and I'm, in a couple slides I'm going to talk about what they figured out in adult dosing around that with obese adults, but um, that obese children require more per weight than obese adults. Um, so, um, and they're sort of still sorting this out. Um, there, uh, someone uh, just published in 2013 a um, RCT looking at antimicrobials in obese children. They look at uh, cephalazin, tobramycin, gentamicin, and vancomycin. And basically they said there's no difference between obese and normal weight children. So um, that's from randomized controlled trials. But once again, small, we, we don't have tons of data yet. Adult studies. One, and this, this is anybody who prescribes for uh, teenagers, so this is important. Um, oral contraceptives, we know that um, obesity does affect the pharmacokinetics of the low-dose oral contraceptives. And, um, and so um, this is probably the reason that obese women have a lot of contraceptive failures. And what they are recommending is either increasing your oral contraceptive dose. So don't use the 20 micro for your obese girls. Go up just a little bit. You don't have to go way up, but go up a little bit. 
or do continuous dosing with these ones. Okay, they say that continuous dosing decreases your um, uh, contraceptive failure in obese girls. But even then, I wouldn't use your very, you know, those really low dose oral contraceptives in your teenage girls that are obese, uh, just because we it, it is we know with the patch, you know, the patch is really not effective of, at once you get above 200 pounds, 198. But I say 200. But you know, it's it's really and, and it really has to do with volume of distribution. It's a lipophilic drug. It goes out into the fat tissue. Probably the reason continuous dosing works is that when things get distributed into fat, they don't stay there forever. They come back out eventually. So you basically, it's going out into the fat and then it's coming back in. But you, and by doing continuous dosing, you're sort of eventually getting the therapeutic levels all settled, all in the same area. Anoxaparin. So um, in adults, the normal anoxaparin dosing is one milligram per kilogram, but they found with um, a, a, a v, a obese adults with DVTs that um, uh, they get they should do dose them at 0.71 milligrams per kilogram because they have they, it's effective. That's what works. And when you get to one milligrams per kilogram in those obese adults that you have a lot more um, adverse effects. But with kids, you have to dose them a little higher. But of course, they don't have a number yet. Okay, they don't say, okay, we know that they need to be dosed or now you do it, is it 0.8, is it one, we're not sure. But we do know kids, you have to, you can't really dose it at this low and get the anticoagulant effect you want. More studies are being done in this area. Once again, how many kids are on anoxaparin, right? So that's another one of those areas where they can start using some of that pool data and try to figure this out, what's gonna work. Okay. Uh, there was a big adult uh, review of the literature study done looking at antibacterial drugs and uh, um, adults. They looked at beta-lactams. It, it was a review article. Vancomycin, macrolides, fluoroquinolones, aminoglycosides. Their conclusion was, we need more studies. <laughs> <laughs> They seem to work just fine at the regular dosing. Because remember adults, we sort of get to adult dosing, we just adult. You know, we don't dose them by weight, right? And so they think that they're, they're fine, but, you know, they, you know, they looked at everything. They, no, we, they haven't looked at good data in adults either. Because what adult is going to say, okay, you want to sign up for the fat people group or the skinny people group, okay? It's just it's hard to get data. And when you think about our normal prescribing, how many people that we give a amoxicillin to, do we say, okay, now go to the lab and get your lab blood drawn. We just don't. We don't, we don't, they're not sick enough to need those studies. So to get studies in these are uh, uh, kind of tough. But they're working on it because we have a problem in the United States with obesity. We have to figure this out. Folate pharmacokinetics is interesting. This is kind of an old study. It's 10 years old, but I, you don't really hear about it. They do know that obese women have lower folate levels, and so they probably need to take more folic acid than recommended during pregnancy to have sort of the effect. Although that whole thing about folic acid in pregnancy is now up in the air too. But um, but if they're taking folic, uh, folate, they probably should take a little bit more, or at least take take it. Okay, obesity is. So I don't have the answer in obesity. I wish I did, <laughs> but I don't. Uh, now we're going to shift to pharmacogenetics, and uh, pharmacogenetics is another area that's kind of exciting if you are a um, person like me who's kind of interested in all this. Um, it's an area that is rapidly exploding. We got the human genome identified. We've sort of figured it out, which now they can go in and sort of look which genes are associated with things. We're doing a lot of it around um, diagnosing of diseases, uh, and um, now pharmacogenetics is really looking at, okay, does everybody process the medications the same based on their genetics? And so we, we of course, can do a lot of work in cancer because, once again, we've got kids that are getting lots of blood drawn, and we could just add a little bit of extra blood to be sent off for a test. So we know, and this has actually been around for about 10 years, we've started to figure out about 10 years ago that ALL, there's certain types of ALL, certain genotypes of patients with, um, in patients with ALL that are chemo resistant. And they can test them now ahead of time and say, you know, these kids don't get this medication because they're going to be resistant. Um, we know that there are uh, certain um, uh, polymorphisms. Uh, which is, you know, genetic variations that lead to increased toxicity of chemotherapy in some patients. So they get more oral mouth sores. They get delayed platelet recovery. We know exactly what genotype that is. They can go in and study that. 
We also know that there's decreased clearance of um, uh, doxydenonyl in some um, patients. This is an area where they're really working hard because you can do genetic studies and sort of once they figure this out, then they can um, do the pharmacology studies to link up to that. Kids with trisomy 21 are more sensitive to methotrexate, so they're going to have more uh, uh, adverse effects. And um, so we know that certain syndromes, genetically, the syndrome, whatever, whatever gene is causing the syndrome is probably going to make them um, also have some drug uh, variability also. Uh, we know that there's some uh, racial and ethnic res uh, differences. Let's see if I can make my arrow go around here. Oh and um, how people respond to therapy. Um, so we're looking specifically, is it, is it, so we know that kids with Spanish surnames, and so they look at the name. They, don't, they didn't do gene studies on, on the pediatric oncology group looked at kids with ALL, and they looked at um, kids that had Spanish surnames and African American names had poorer outcomes. But is it because of genes? Or is it because of are they disadvantaged to begin with so they're not getting treatment as early? That's what they have to sort out. And so um, that's a piece that they're looking at right now. So one of the things that, that is exciting is, it, and, and you see this with breast cancer. Women with breast cancer, you know, have you seen this where they, they do their testing ahead of time to see are they receptor positive, are they going to respond to the chemotherapy or not, so that they can target their chemotherapy. They're doing this with colon cancer, and um, so we're looking at kids and genetics so that we can really target, so we get the, the treatment we want, it's not resistant, and we're, not, we're getting as few adverse effects as possible. What's really exciting is ADHD, and I've got more information later on ADHD. There was a big study down at University of Queensland, which is actually where one of my sons just started medical school, by the way, in uh, Brisbane. And um, I actually, I, I only put that in there because I was reading the study. I'm like, oh, that's where Patrick's going to school. <laughs> so, so they looked at um, a genetic link, and they looked at the genes, OK? They just look at genes, and they said, how likely is it that a mental health disorder is genetically linked, okay? And they looked at uh, ADHD, they looked at depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, et cetera, because they really wanted to figure this out. And ADHD is like at the top of the bar. 28% of the risk for ADHD is genetically linked, looking at the genes, okay? So what does that tell you? You know, you've got a disease that comes down through families, and um, we are uh, now at a point where we are trying to prescribe, right? And, and so now we have to look, is this a genetic reason they are or not responding to the medication? So because we know it's a genetic, possibly a genetic a reason that people are there. There's still some empty chairs up front. It's OK. <laughs> and um, so anyway, so what, the, what we do know is that um, ADHD is probably part of it is not enough neurotransmitters available in the synapse. Um, we need more dopamine. We need a little bit more of that. And so they think that there is um, a link between the rate of methylphenidate um, and dopamine transmitter, and so that um, kids will or will not respond to methylphenidate based on their genetics. Okay, so you get these kids, you put them on methylphenidate, and you up the dose, and you up the dose, and up the dose, and nothing happens. Well, it's probably or possibly, we don't know, genetics, and that's where the studies are going to go next. Is okay? Is this a genetic reason that they're not? We we you know. So you can do the studies and sort of say, okay, it looks like there's this relation. Now you got to do the controlled studies and figure it out. Okay, but well, that could be why. Genetically, they're not going to respond because they just don't have the ability to respond, okay? We know that there is a difference between the way people um, metabolize amoxetine um, because of the uh, genetic differences in their CYP450 um, uh, enzymes. And so, so, some, so, you know, so we've got all this stuff we're thinking about with ADHD, right? You've got, you know, you got the family, you've got the school, you've got the medications, and then you go, oh, 
you know, always keep in the back of your mind, it could be the reason they're not responding is they're not going to respond because of genetics and maybe just switch to a different drug class. You know, go from methylphenidate, try one of the um, amphetamines or something and see if that's what it is. Because that's the one variable that you can control more than sort of the family. And if you think about genetics, if you've got parents that have ADHD, right, because it's genetic, and they're trying to manage a kid with ADHD, that's a very a, a confounding variable that is difficult to control. And I don't have to tell you, if you're managing kids with ADHD, ADHD you probably have already seen this in your practice. So, but anyway, we're getting the, we're getting the information now to sort of prove our gut, right? We've always kind of known this, I think, and now it's coming out. So a new exciting area that's happening, and we've talked about uh, pharmacogenetics and asthma, I think, since I've started doing these talks, but we're getting better at it, okay? So one of the things that's happening is we are, it's very clear that there's genetic differences in how people respond to asthma medicines. Who does it? We don't know. That's what we have to sort out. So we know that there's polymorphisms, meaning there's differences between people in their beta-2 receptors and um, how well they respond to the beta agonists. And so you, if you have a kid and they, everything is correct, they're using it correctly, okay, you've watched them use it, everything's good, and they're not responding, it's a possibility that this is a genetic thing that they're not gonna respond to albuterol, okay? Which is tricky, because there are not many other things to use, right? So, um, but just remember that they're, they do know this. They've got, this has been around for about eight to 10 years. They're just trying to sort it out. It's not like we can go say, okay, let's draw your blood. We gotta figure out if you are gonna respond to albuterol. We don't have that piece of the test yet. And we have some genetic testing, quite a bit, and that's growing every year, but we don't have something for this. We also know that there is quite a bit of difference um, between uh, how people respond to the inhaled corticosteroids. And they've narrowed it down, not only to the gene, but to the allele on the enzyme of the 3A4, um, CYP3A4. So what they found is that kids that had the CYP3A4 22 allele responded better to the inhaled corticosteroids than kids who didn't, okay? And um, there's a few, uh, let me see, I think it was 7% oh, 7 of the kids um, uh, didn't respond, or uh, the ones that had it, re seven, uh, let me see, seven percent of the control group when they looked at it um, responded. So one of the things that we have to figure out is, are we going to have to test all the kids that we're putting on inhaled corticosteroids for this, or are we going to have kids that don't respond and we go, okay, is it technique? Is it, are they not using it? Or is it, are they using it and doing everything right and they're going to be one of the kids that are not going to respond to inhaled corticosteroids? That's where the future is. And having been in this business where we, like 10 years ago, we're just going, well, there's probably some, they're narrowing it down and narrowing it down. And I'm doing a, a talk on pharmacogenetics on Thursday. And they, the D FDA now has a whole slew of uh, genetic tests that we can do, just not once for these yet, okay? But they're coming. So there is a time where we're gonna be able to say, okay, we're gonna prescribe this medication. We should do this test to see before we do this. So this is kind of exciting. A new article just came out in 2014 looking at pharmacogenetics and acetaminophen. And, and if you uh, understand pharmacogenetics, kind of it makes sense, because acetaminophen actually needs a lot of steps to break down, so AP, AP is in the middle up there, right? And so we've got all these things that have to happen in order for acetaminophen to totally be metabolized. And so, um, so the three big CYP enzymes are 1A2, 3A4, and 2C, 2E. Um, uh, which one is it? 2E something. Uh, anyway, so they, is, they think it's not that, those. Because we know that other drugs, we have genetic polymorphisms, especially in uh, 3A4 and 1A2, where, where you have genetic differences is how they respond. So it's not that with acetaminophen. It's probably this UGT gene that is causing some differences. And so what we see in adults is that there's differences in hepatotoxicity. So, you know, this big push now is we have to use less acetaminophen. Um, there probably is a genetic risk factor for people, even, you know, at sort of the normal doses. Or one person could take a high dose and be fine, and the person who genetically is not able to break it down as well, 
is the one that's going to be hepatotoxic. And so this is an area, this is a fairly new work. They're really looking hard at this to see if they can figure out, um, you know, who shouldn't take acetaminophen. So we're talking about our bread and butter pediatrics, right? And these are in adults, but, but you know, five, ten years from now, we're going to have some studies in kids, and we're going to be able to say certain kids probably shouldn't be taking um, uh, acetaminophen, which is kind of scary when you think about how much we recommend it, right? So anyway, that's just that's new, and um, they're looking at this, and uh, just uh, stay tuned. Okay. But we do know this is a this is children. This was a bad outcome in children. Uh, in 2012, the FDA the, uh, had some reports. It actually started about 2011, where some kids that had taken acetaminophen with codeine were having respiratory distress, um, significant respiratory depression, um, and they were reported into the MedWatch. And they started collecting some data. And what there were three pediatric deaths. Um, there was um, some cases of uh, 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 life-threatening respiratory depression. And so they started looking at this. And what they figured out is, so if you remember your pharmacology, and I, you don't have to tell me when you took it or that you still have dust on the pharmacology book, because I know it's probably up on your shelf still. But um, so codeine is metabolized into morphine. Okay, and so you have two pain medicines when you give codeine. And so what you get is if kids or anybody is a ultra metabolizer, they break down the codeine into morphine faster than predicted, so you get higher levels of morphine in the blood than you would expect. So we know that they, so they figured out it's the kids that are ultra metabolizers that were doing this. And um, so there is a, uh, um, we know, so the problem is they don't come with a label that says I'm an ultra metabolizer, okay? They don't say that. So we know about 66% 6, 6 of Caucasians are ultra metabolizers. Um, if you look at Ethiopians, you're getting up into the, like 23%. So uh, kids that are from Ethiopia. But kids that are um, black kids from the United States are down similar to Caucasian rates of like 6%. So, and we don't really have a good test. I mean, you know, so you, you see you're in the exam room and you want to write for some acetaminophen with codeine or codeine cough syrup, right? And you're going to the parents. Well, we have to send you to the lab. We're going to have you draw your blood to see if you're going to be the one that does the, that's going to respond more strongly to this. And then we'll decide whether we, we, we just can't do that. And we're not going to do that. It's probably better just to not prescribe it. Um, but, but, so, but that is really the thinking of think. Is this going to be the one kid in my, you know, panel that's going to be the one that's going to be an ultra metabolizer? And so what you'll hear from parents, or you could ask parents, because it is genetically linked. Do you, are you more sensitive to pain medicine? Do you, when you take codeine, do you get more sleepy or do you feel more sedated? Because that will tell you that probably there's a likelihood the kids may be like that. Okay. Um, it has, they've given codeine a black box warning now uh, for um, pediatric prescribing another drug relabeled that we've used my whole career, okay? Um, and this was just given a black box warning like a year or so ago. And what it says is if you're going to prescribe codeine to children, especially two to five-year-olds, you need to prescribe at the lowest effective dose. You don't do um, around-the-clock dosing. So don't say give it every four hours. You say give it PRN. Okay, and you need to talk to the parents about the fact that if their child seems to be more sleepy, they need to watch their respiratory rate. If they seem very sedated, that they probably need to stop giving it. Okay, and so now if you are prescribing codeine for any reason, you must be informing parents of this. Okay, now personally, I, did, I practiced my first 10 years without a DEA number because I don't think kids need codeine most of the time. But I was in the outpatient setting. I didn't do kids with fractures or anything like that. Now I do a little bit more of that. But I still don't prescribe codeine unless it's like a kid that broke something pretty big time. Um, so, so, you know, just think about what you're doing. Um, codeine cough syrup shouldn't be prescribed at all to kids anyway. So if you are, this is another reason not to do it, okay? So, but anyway, this is interesting. Some, some drug, how many of you guys have, how many of you have been out here more than 20 years? 
20 years? Okay, codeine's been around longer than we have, okay? So here's something that's been around forever and they're relabeling it because of studies in kids. Okay, breastfed babies. Uh, well, this is the other thing that um, we're gaining information on and it's very exciting because um, we are, we're not necessarily prescribing to the moms unless you're a family nurse practitioner, but we do have to take care of that baby. So we need to know what exposures that infant has. So there's a really great database that has been developed over the last few years, and it's amazing. I'm going to show you some information from it in just a minute. It's called LactMed, and um, so you can always Google it. It's really easy, LactMed, okay? And it's one of the ToxNet websites. And so one of the things we need to think about when we're looking at an infant that is mom is lactating is that is mom an ultra metabolizer. So if mom gets codeine and she's breaking it down to morphine faster and getting higher levels, that increases the baby who's breastfeeding's exposure to the morphine. Okay? So so we have to think about that piece. Um, we have to think about timing of the feeding. So we don't like to use really long-acting drugs because the best thing is if they nurse right before they take a dose of the therapeutic le the levels in the breast milk are as low as possible. And so if you use short-acting drugs, you can kind of get that. If you're using a long-acting drug, it's harder because your levels are always high. Um, you, you've got the infant's pharmacokinetics, and they've got developmental variation across infancy of how they're handling drugs. And then, and then you have the milk plasma ratio. It's not a straightforward thing. You've got all these things you have to think about with the lactating woman. Fortunately, they've done some really good um, research and they've collected the data. So this is what the LACMED website looks like. They've just updated it if you haven't been on there recently. It was just updated a few months ago. Um, it's really great. You just type in the medicine. And right there it says search your leader SSRIs and you just hit search. So you can just type in the medicine. And then it tells you exactly. I did fluoxetine because a lot of women are on Prozac, okay, and they're breastfeeding. And so um, one of the things that we look at is, um, is this safe in breastfeeding? So I'm going to read this just because it'll tell you what kind of great information you get. It says, the average amount of drug in breast milk is higher with fluoxetine than most other SSRIs. And the long-acting active metabolite nor fluoxetine is detectable in the serum of most breastfed infants during the first two months postpartum and in a few thereafter. Adverse effects such as colic, fussiness, and drowsiness have been reported in some breastfed infants. Decreased infant weight gain was found in one study but not others. No adverse effects on development have been found in a few infants followed for up to a year. Okay, I got it. Where's my arrow? Where'd it go? Anyway, um, if fluoxetine is required by the mo mother, it's not a reason to discontinue the medication, okay? Um, but if you're choosing to start somebody on fluoxetine, try a different drug, okay? Well, I can't read the exact words. I was, I was reading directly. But what, so basically, if they're already on fluoxetine, leave them on there, but watch the infant for weight gain. And if they're colicky, it may be from that, okay? So when you're doing your two-week two visits, ask mom if they're taking any antidepressants because, like, a lot of people are. And so that baby is, that maybe it was a baby you're going to watch weight gain more carefully on, okay? And um, then also if you are a prescriber that is starting a new mom on an antidepressant, choose one of the other ones if you can over fluoxetine because the other ones have less effects on the infant. So this is what a great thing. You can just go in and type in the medicine. It's going to give you great data. It'll tell you how to monitor the kids, whether uh, it's safe or not, how much data they have. Um, but what's really nice is right at the beginning, they give this little summary. You don't have to read the whole thing. Because I don't know about you, but I have a lot of time in clinic to go look up everything, right? But I got a computer right there, and I can just type it in. I know ToxNet is there. I can just type it in, and really quick, they give you the summary right at the beginning, and you can go, okay, this is okay, or no, I need to think of something else, okay? So you, these are our tax dollars at works, folks, so let's use them. It's great. Um, drug shortages. This is, how many of you guys are experiencing drug shortages? Oh, it's so frustrating. You're right for, like, doxycycling. Oh, we don't have that. And I'm like, what? <laughs> or, or whatever. It seems like it's, like, always something. Um, this is an interesting area. There could be that it is unanticipated manufacturing problems, 
or the manufacturers decide this drug is no longer profitable, so it's going to just stop manufacturing it. Okay, we had a we had a shortage of normal saline. Did anybody see that? Normal saline. How do you get a shortage of normal saline? You know, how hard can that be to make, right? And I, you can't imagine that it doesn't make money because like everybody uses it. So what is the deal there? Um, so anyway, there's there's who knows why it is. The problem is. Nobody really controls the manufacturers. If they decide that a drug isn't profitable anymore and they don't want to make it, nobody can go say, hey, you need to make that. You know, you need to do that. The FDA doesn't control that. Um, and so it's a tough one because, you know, you know we've got these problems and, and it's all about money. Not always, but mostly about money. Um, the FDA does create, have a... Uh, a part of their website where if you're, you go, someone that says, there's a shortage, you can actually go in there and they'll say, do they think it's a short-term shortage? Is it like a manufacturing problem and they're going to turn it around pretty quickly? Or is this going to be, this is a long-term shortage? Because it's one thing when you're trying to make a decision and it's a 10-day thing, right? You're going to, you need it for 10 days. Yeah, it's a, you can just find something else. But if you're looking at long-term treatment and you're trying to start something on something and there's a shortage, it'd be nice to know, is this shortage going to be a short one and a month or two it's going to be different? Or is this something I just shouldn't even go there? Okay. So, um, and, and I wish we could do something about this and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Has anybody done a MedWatch report ever? Oh, good. I see a couple hands. Great. So, it's actually our job to submit MedWatch reports. That's how they get, th that's where the coding data came from. Somebody sent a couple reports in and they said, oh, what's this? And then they started looking for more of it. So um, you can, uh, uh, it's, it's voluntary adverse event reporting. It can be done by parents, patients, or providers. Um, you can also go, this is, I'm on there, I'm on the MedWatch list. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a farm geek. So, but what, what you, what I get is, I get the emails that say, this, this has now got a new warning, or this is a new alert, or whatever, and they just come in, and so that's how I, I find out about things, such as the saline, um, shortage. But if, they, especially if there's a new drug, uh, adverse effect that they're wanting to watch, they'll send it out, and then, then they can, so what they do is they say, hey, we're seeing this. You know, you know, you know. So they send it out so that people can sort of look, and if they're seeing it, then they can get more reports in, and they can see is it really a problem or was it just sort of an isolated event. You can also report. Uh, there's an online reporting for a form, um, and you, and, or you can call a 1-800 number if you don't want to fill out the form online. And um, you also should be reporting dietary supplements and tobacco use. So I don't know about you, but we've been having some kids. Um, locally that are um, overdosing on the e-cigarette stuff and um, so those all need to be called in because we need to get we need to get report at the national le reports at the national level so they can do something about regulating those and if all of us who see this in our practice or see something happening like that if we all report this they're going to start getting some uh, ability to push back against these unregulated drugs dietary supplements are the same way this is um, a, uh, to, an August of 2014, the DEA reclassified combination acetaminophen products. Um, and um, they are, um, what they recommend is that we continue prescribing and dispensing um, any acetaminophen combination product that is more than a 325 milligram tablet. So, um, that is something that you need to be aware of. That is fairly new. And so if you're dealing with teenagers, you really want to stay at 325 milligram tablets on any combination product. Did you know this? Okay, it's fairly new. Okay. Uh, I, I, they're going to go after acetaminophen, by the way. We are spending too much money on liver transplants from acetaminophen poisoning. There's going to be, they're going to really crack down on this over the next few, that and Vicodin, which is already now scheduled two, two right? It's, and so they're moving um, on all this. Okay. Um, there's a new, this is actually not, this is from December 2012, but if you didn't come last year, you don't know this. I had this last year. This is a black box warning on methylphenidate. And so this is the, <laughs> this is, okay, you just go like, what in the world? 
Methylphenidate, and so what it does is it causes priapism in some boys, in some young boys. And we don't know why, and, but it's, it's um, now a black box warning. So you know what a black box warning means? If you're writing for methylphenidate for, um, it's, usually it's about 12 is when it seems to start, according to the, what they're saying here, is um, that there's an there's a increased risk of priapism. And so if you're writing for it, be sure that you're informing the child and parents that this is a rare adverse effect of methylphenidate. Okay, so um, <laughs> it is rare, but it can happen. And, and you know, can you imagine the poor parent and kid going, "What in the world is that?" And what happened? And, and then they find out it's the ADHD medicine that caused it. It's kind of a weird. I mean, very weird. We've been prescribing this a long time. How come this taking so long to figure this one out? So anyway, don't know what's going on, but there is a new black box warning for this. So basically, in summary. A lot of things are happening. A lot of things are changing. A lot of things are moving rapidly. If you are not up to date, if you aren't keeping it on reading all this new labels and stuff that are coming out, you're probably behind the times. When you have 500 and something drugs that have been relabeled in the last 15 years, that's, that's a lot of drugs, you know? So, so um, I'm glad you come to, to see me. I do try to keep up and up to date. I'm sure there's always something that, is, that I miss when I'll pick it up for next year. But uh, anyway, in, in the pharmacogenetics and obesity piece, just stay tuned, because this is where the next big information of, uh, is gonna come from.